Alex, Axel, thank you so much for being on the show. It was great being on your podcast as well. Love your podcast. Now, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became successfully unemployed. Uh, well, thanks for having me, Dustin. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I actually really like the theme of successfully unemployed because it really, it rarely goes together, those two words. Um, and, and and what happened, how I became successfully unemployed, I was in the corporate world. I always felt like I had a, an itch for, for entrepreneurial. And I know it sounds cliche. It's just, I remember being at my desk and thinking like, man, if this was my company, I would do this, or I would do that, or why don't we do develop this? And so after you know, five, six years, I just kind of, I changed job, actually, I changed position within the industry. And after a year at my new employer, like, I just wasn't having it. Um, and I can just go into a little bit more detail if, if, if it's actually a, a, of interest It's just that I got poached by one of our suppliers. And it's a large rail company in Canada that I won't name, but it's not too hard, because there's really two of them. And it was presented as like the best company to work for the best thing, like, it's a career for life, you'll go up the ranks, except you're working with it's not even a cargo ship, it's a it's like a cruise ship next to an aircraft carrier. It's so big. And anything you're trying to do is like, yeah, but you got to do this, and you got to do that and the red tape and stuff. And I hit my head against the chop, 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 let's make things move. And I always had ideas and I lasted a year over there. Um, then I transitioned to taking, I took two six months contracts as, as a consultant in operations management of just like small companies trying to develop, came in for a specific project. Uh, I did two of them back to back. It was fun, but in a way I was still an employee is that I was invoicing instead of having a salary. Um, and then at the time with my wife, we were already investing in real estate and that's when I went full ahead into real estate investing. I had it somewhat similar in a sense where I was doing something. It wasn't like I hated the job, but I was like, man, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. And so I was really blessed to be able to find real estate. Now, what type of real estate investing do you do? Because there's a, definitely a, a few different types. Flipping, in my opinion, it, people call it investing, but you have to work a lot to flip a house. But yeah, talk to us about what type of investing that you do. Sure. So we actually, our strategy has been more some is buy and hold. We've actually never actually flipped anything as in, and when I define a flip as like you buy a house and three, six months later, you just add value and you resell it back. Like we've added a lot of value is just that we've refinanced. We've done a lot more burrs, uh, buy, rehab, refinance, no, rent, rehab, rehab. Bah. Anyways, everyone knows what a burr is and in the proper order that I'm not describing. Um, and so we've, with my wife, we invest for the next 30 years, we invest for our kids, and we want to build value in the long run. So we actually haven't really sold anything other than just one property because it was ripe. And that's it was a bit of a different situation. So we are located, we're in Canada in Montreal, Quebec, we invest, uh, we've started with um, condos, uh, we did one or two, and then in a small multi family, so five around five units, and then, you know, a five unit with a partner and then one on our own. And now we're scaling and uh, we're still buying some small multifamily. We have a six under contract right now. We're also looking at new construction for 17 units and uh, with two other four units that were in the process of uh, renovating. Man, that sounds terrific. Now, do you invest only in Canada? Cause I know you invest in America and Canada as well. Like talk to us a little bit about the dynamic of living in Canada and also being an investor. For now, we kind of stuck to our local market. Um, I, I've looked a lot into the U.S. I've lo I followed a lot of actually um, U.S.-based podcasts, and I know how a lot of people say, "Yeah, you get, get like twice the returns for half of the down payment," and so on and so forth. And I know it's true. Um, it's just that I still like to be able to jump in my car, drive 15 minutes, and go see the property and go talk to a tenant or go fix something. Even though I try not to fix anything myself anymore, uh, but I, I like having it all within a 20 or 30 minute radius so for now we've really stuck to our local market but in the future we're definitely open to investing in the u.s but i want to start with with a, a a strong solid knowledgeable local partner so a lot of people they hesitate or they don't get into investing because they have the limitations lots of limitations in their brain and you know the risk tolerance something the fact that you have to be able to get over um, so I tolerate risk. I can invest all over the country and be okay with that. And other people, like I have, like you were saying, 
I really want to invest in my area so I can go to the property. As long as we get over that hurdle where we buy that first property, it could be you're in the same neighborhood, same city. It could be a thousand miles away. As long as we get over that hurdle. Now, talk to us about if we were to get started and we're thinking about buying a rental property, a lot of people talk about, you know, oh man, you could get appreciation. You know, that, that's something you want to invest for. Do you invest for a passive income? Do you invest for p- appreciation? What are your thoughts about, you know, the types of property that you're going to be buying and what is the return that you're looking for? Definitely. That's, that's a, a big question. So my advice for someone who's looking to start at first is first, before you do anything, 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 educate yourself. Talk to Dustin, talk to someone else. There's plenty of options, but you can't go and pretend that you want to go buy a $300,000 property if you can't invest $3,000 in yourself. That is number (laughs) one. And if you can't do it, you're in the wrong line of business. Number two is get to know the market that you're interested in, whether it's your backyard or whether it's halfway across the country. A lot of people in Canada right now invest in Ohio. They invest in Texas. That's fantastic because they've invested the time to get to know the local market, to talk to people, to start to build a team on the ground, boots, talk to a property manager before you talk to a real estate agent, uh, just have random conversation with like your average tenants, uh, educate yourself about, about the local markets. And then once you're ready, then you can start to look for properties. In my, I invest for the long run, so I look for both cash flow and appreciation. Sometimes you can have a lot of one uh, or a, a lot of the other. Over time, you want you want um, a mix of both because at the end of the month, you have bills to pay. You need to pay your utilities and your mortgage and stuff. So you need cash right now. But at the same time, you want to take advantage of the appreciation and the fact that someone else is going to be paying your mortgage. I love that aspect of rental properties. I mean, when you think about it, you're paying whatever down payment you're going to be putting down. You put down a down payment, but your tenant is literally going to be paying the rest of the principal and interest, taxes, insurance, property manager. Like if you account for all those expenses before you buy the property, they're going to be paying for that. Now, if we were to go to find and start investing, is the first step the best? Like, do we need to start saving a ton of money? Do we need to start, obviously, education? You are 100% right. Like you definitely need to learn what you're doing because if you don't know what you're doing and you don't follow somebody that's already done it before, you're going to be learning doing learning by the school of hard knocks. You know, basically you're going to be putting in a lot of your own effort and not getting good return. But let's say we're getting started. We want, we found a property. How do we know a property is a good deal for us in our real estate investing? Well, to me, it goes back to education. You've got to understand the basic math of it, how it works and um, what, you're, what, what you're actually buying. Like at, at the basis, basis, basis of it, I like to rationalize it as I'm buying a box that is going to pay me and appreciate in value. Now, wherever that box is, whatever that box looks like, it doesn't really matter. I just got to find that box. So you're right. Like there's different markets with different down payments. How, you know, do you need money to start? A little bit. Money always helps, but there's also plenty of people who've started to invest in real estate with little or no money down. And now it's no, it sounds cliche to say that, like invest in real estate with no money down. But if you are willing to do the hard work and, and put some elbow grease into it and you partner up with someone who happens to have 50K, but they have no time, you can do a great partnership and have a percentage of a deal and you've actually put none of your money into it. So it is a win-win. So is the first step to uh, obviously education and start lear- learning and understanding the numbers. What was your first step to um, find a property that is like, do you have to drive to next to you? And then when you started doing that, did you knock on doors? How do we actually start getting, a, you basically get a property under contract? We both know there's so many ways to go about it. In my case, our first uh, multifamily, it was, it was through an agent. And ironically, I was focusing on a particular area and I asked him about four or five properties. And then he was like, hey, you didn't ask me about this one. Could it be of interest? And I looked at it and was like, actually, yeah. And that's the one we ended up buying. Um, and now I don't, I, I go off market for the most part. 
and we've the other technique like we've door knock we've we, we drive around we have two young kids we with my wife we love to stick him in the in, in the back seat of the car go drive for an hour and a half literally with the clipboard um and and take some addresses do some research pick an area of town and kind of and drive around and see see if the, if it'd be a good neighborhood uh we also do some mailers and i work with someone who's who's really in charge of that and we've had some great results even this week we had a put a property under contract that was through 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 a mailing and then just talking to people best way i find is just then is the networking it's telling everybody what is it that you're looking for in what area and i always incentivize people and i've told people at my local corner store literally like two corners away from here like hey if you hear of anything and you know you find me a property like i'll give you a thousand bucks for it and their eyes open like what you give me a thousand bucks if i just put you in touch with an owner who wants to sell I'm like yeah absolutely and so you just got to leave breadcrumbs for people to mm -hmm. bring them back to you. That's great. Now, do you manage the property yourself? So less and less. There's still some that I take care of a little bit because there's almost nothing to do. And then the rest I've given out to someone uh, in management uh, and him and I work closely together. So it's not an outside management company. It's just that I'm not personally taking all the phone calls and doing the visits and stuff like that anymore. No. So how do you find somebody that's going to be working alongside you? Is it something like you put an ad on the paper for, hey, I'm looking for an employee? You know, it's an excellent question because still to this day, I feel like I, I was blessed. And at the same time, you know, you, you attract what you what you plant. Um, I had someone reach out to me, a young guy, uh, very good, very motivated, 19 years old, at, 18 years old at the time who wanted to learn. He, he was very interested by real estate and we started to chat. And I told him, you know, if you, he's a bird dog. And I told him, if you find a property, I'll buy it. And then he actually brought a property that I bought. And I told him, look, you, he was like, oh, I want to learn. Can I stick around? I told him, look, I will take you on the full cycle of acquisition, renovation, rent, refinance. And then hopefully we can repeat together and I'll pay you the monthly fees, except you handle some of the work. So he's met with some of the contractors for quotes. He's handled the tenants and stuff like that. And so now he's like full on part of the team. He's my right hand. And I, I almost couldn't function without him anymore. And this is someone that he reached out to me and he showed me through his actions, how motivated he was. Now you're going to say, yeah, but you just got lucky. He reached out to you and stuff. Sometimes yes, and sometimes yeah. Sometimes you put an ad, or sometimes you talk to people, and someone's like, "Hey, I'd be interested in in investing in real estate. How can I learn?" Well, you know, you really want to learn? Let's go spend six months together, and we'll see if you still want to do it. Because then you get to train that person in the way you want. You share your knowledge, and it it becomes, you know, you you fit them in your mold, so to speak. And everybody listening, if you want to become a real estate investor, you absolutely need to listen to what Axel just said. If you call up an investor, somebody like you, uh, give you an example, you go on to Craigslist, you look for a property for rent or wherever you can look for a property for rent and you find a place for rent and you see the same phone number. It might be a property manager. It might be a landlord. It might be somebody that, that owns properties. You call them up and say, hey, can I come and work for you for free? Like you might be thinking, oh my goodness, why would I work for free? Well, you're getting paid in experience in knowledge from the person that's mentoring you, making sure you're not going to do the wrong things, as well as network, their network that you're going to be around. Like I would absolutely pay Warren Buffett to work for him. Like I wouldn't want to get paid. I wouldn't even do it for free. I'd pay him because the people that I'd be around, the experience that I would get working there, as well as just the knowledge of just being around him. My goodness, that's worth so much more than getting paid. So if you want to get started, the best thing to do is be around somebody that's already doing it and show them that, like you said, Alec, Axel, that they are they have initiative, they want to do it, and they're going to be putting effort into it. And that's going to be the best education you're ever going to get. Okay, so from there, let's say, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I, I just want to build because you made me think of something that in how people reach out and tell me if it's the same thing for you, like with the podcast and with the real estate investing, I have no people that reach out like every day, every week. And the thing is that there is a few that have reached out in a way where I'm like, oh my God, I want to meet this guy. And I'm just going to give you an example. About two, three months ago, there's another guy that reached out and said, hey, Excel, I really like your podcast, The Very Real Estate Effect. Um, there's this guy in Ontario that has a podcast as well. I think it'd be really cool if like you guys like connected and stuff. And I'm like, okay, that's a great idea. He put me in touch with him. I, I was on his podcast 
And we, we continued. And then I called back the guy and say, hey, thanks. Thanks a lot, man. We had one or two really good conversations. He works for a fairly large um, con uh, contractor, like for a very big developer. He's very knowledgeable, like 27, 28 years old. And the more I talk to this guy, I'm like, I want to work with you. I want you on my team. And the thing is that he initiated the contact by building value first. Mm -hmm. And that is like in opposition to someone who reaches out and say, Hey, I want to get into real estate investing. Can we meet for coffee so I can pick your brain? <laughs> pick your brain. Come on. Oh my goodness. Pick your brain. I had it someone a lot of money to pick last my brain. week. Yeah. Want to cost money to pick my brain. And it's like, it makes you sound like a vulture. You're not yes. a bird. Yep. You're, you're an individual. And so the advice to everyone listening, pick someone who's just a little bit further than you down the, the spiral of what it is that you want to do. And then just offer to build value first. And another example is like, hey, you know, I, I see like I was on your website. I see maybe your website could need a bit of help. I happen to be good with this. Like if you want, I could just do like two, three hours of work on it just to improve like your SEO score. It's just an example, you know, mm -hmm. or so many things like that, that then people are like, yeah, I, I want to do something with you. And it's like creating the attraction to yourself instead of be a beggar. If you're provi providing basically value you're showing that i want to help then it's so much more attractive for somebody who is further along that would want to work with you i get all the time obviously because of my experience as podcasting coaching and all this sort of stuff all the time like on instagram hey can i can i you know how about this like basically you start asking me like coaching questions I'm like well you know people pay me money to do this so i can't just give it out to you number one but number two like I could be hanging out with my kids. Like it's, it's, I'd rather be doing that as opposed to just be talking to people, but you're right on uh, when people say, Hey, can I pick your brain? Like, Hey, can I not even, not even, can I take you to coffee? It's like, Hey, can we get some coffee? Like, like I'm going to have to go pay for my own coffee and give you free coaching. Like, come on. That's no, thank you. You get, uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to pass on that opportunity. So from there, now we're starting to, let's say we get one or two properties. We have people that are helping us, like we're helping them, we're being mentored. Let's say if we want to scale, is there any tips to scaling? I know you talked about the Burr process where you, you buy, eventually rent it out and you refinance it and you repeat the process. Is there any other tips to scale the business so that we have more properties to then buy more properties and make more money? Right now we're talking in real estate, but I almost want to make this applicable to someone who wants to sell, sell more t-shirts online. Is it's very simple. We all know it. Systematize, build processes. So you actually build a business instead of you build a bunch of functions that only you can do. One, it's a lot more cost effective. Leverage all the resources around you. And if we're going to be talking about real estate, just on the prospecting side, there's ways to go about it. You yourself can't talk to 500 owners a day, but you can build a team of two who can do that within a week. And then you say, hey, if you find a deal and I close on it, I'll give you 0.5%. Then letters, there's companies, you give them a list, you pick the postcard, they'll send it to you. You don't need to do anything. And um, prospecting, like driving for dollars. We, I, I like to drive in the neighborhood that I don't know with my wife when the kids are sleeping. So for us, it's like a break. But like, you can talk to a taxi driver and say, hey, Whenever you see a property that's run down, send me a picture of the address. If I close, I'll give you 0.5%. That's just basic. And that's just the prospecting. And so now on the operation side, okay, build your team. And I know you're a big proponent of that. And so I, so am I. I try to only work with the same notary. So it's a bit different US and Canada. For the closing here, we don't go through a title company. We go through a notary. Uh, so go i always work with the same notary we know each other we know what's important and i like him a lot because he's very stiff and i say that with all my all my all my all my loving heart like he will vow he will be on he will protect me is what i mean and then always work with the same inspector if possible depending on the type of property oh try to build a team around you of professionals that you have a relationship with and even payment terms become more flexible. They know you're going to pay. They know you're going to come through. You don't need to pay in 15 days. You can pay in 30. So, uh, small stuff like that. And then systematize too, like the, uh, the operations, put someone in charge, get, get a new phone number, all the phone, all the, all the calls from the tenants go to that phone number. You can pass the phone, except you got to tell them what to say, how to answer and what are the company guidelines. So just 
systematize because scaling is impossible if you're the business. You have to be able to go on vacation for three weeks and the business functions like you didn't even exist. It didn't even matter. And that's only through processes. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And making sure that the people that you put in place are following those processes on top of that too. And making sure that you're, you know, your money's coming in. Now, in your business, are you thinking about scaling up to multifamily, maybe storage units? Like what, where are you at now? And then where would you like to see yourself growing to? Okay, that's, wow, I love thinking thinking about these, these objectives. Right now we're in small multifamily, and I mean like zero to six units. Well, one, well, two to six units, otherwise it's a single family home. <laughs> and I really want to go into the uh, new construction development because my big dream is to build a neighborhood to create a place, I was going to say a place of life. And and that and that's my goal. And kind of the way to get there is also to you know build it new, build it from scratch. So I want to do like one or two buildings. So eventually I can find a big, big, big plot of land and literally do a neighborhood. That's my big dream and the direction. Now it doesn't stop from us still doing some smaller projects. We found one, we got one under contract this week. It's a it's another five unit, ironically, except the uh, we can double the area, we can build the same building in the back. So we'll go to at least 10 or even maybe 12 units. So it's a redevelopment. Uh, that's that, It's got a big aspect of new construction because we're literally going to be building the same building in the back. So it's a, it's a combination. And it's scary because, you know, doing an optimization of, okay, renovating two or three units, re-rent them, re-renting them, refinancing and stuff, it's just a process. But when you go into bigger projects, it's scary because the numbers are bigger and a small mistake could lead to a much bigger disaster in a way. And so surrounding yourself with the proper team and the proper people is key, but then you got to love it. If you don't love it, if you don't have the passion, if you hate that, go do something else because you're going to be terrible at it. Go back to selling t-shirts online. I definitely agree with that. And I found that the more that I get into investing, whether it's single family homes to um, land investing to syndications like big, you know, 100, 200 unit apartment complexes to storage units, things like that. It's just exciting to me. It's like I just had an interview with another person who does storage units, self storage units, and it got me pumped up. I'm like, man, I want to start doing that, too, because when you think about how passive this business can be, if you do it right, you get the, like you're you're saying, Alex. So you're finding the right people. You're implementing it. You're putting the su- uh, systems and processes in place. You could be making a lot of money, but not just making a lot of money. It's also about helping people. Because I could see building an entire, you know, let's say little neighborhood that you're helping people with good quality housing and you know providing them the ability to live in a good place. That's it, it's all about, in my opinion, helping people. So real estate investing is less about properties. It's more about people. More about how many more people I can help. And the more people that I can help in their life, the better that my life gets. So Axel, is there any lessons learned that you, as going through the life as being an investor, that we should know or we should really take into account? You are the master. Everyone listening, if you want to be successfully unemployed, actually, I do, I do have a, a, a tip. A lot of people are in a situation, as, as we call them, a J-O-B, that they're kind of getting tired of, and they want to go into something else. That's fine, except the transition is the most critical part. So if you want to start a side gig, whether it's real estate investing, whether it's selling t-shirts online or baking cookies or what, try to do, and and you set yourself a goal of, I need to be making 5,000 a month, okay? For three months, try to do 10% of your objective. Are you able for three months in a row to generate $500 a month selling cookies. If yes, you have a chance at a business. You might be able to scale it to actually make 5K a month. If you're able to achieve that, then your your, your side hustle will become a lot more of a small business and then bigger hustle. And then one day you can leave your employment and you can dedicate all your energy into this uh, this business that you've created because you kind of tested it. You, you, it, you tried, it seems to work. It's just at some point you have the courage to believe in your passion, believe in yourself and just go for it. Take action. Now in your life, obviously we could look back and hindsight's always 2020. Is there any insight that you would be able to give your younger self 
that it could be business, it could be life or anything like that, that you would say, hey, younger self, you should know this. Yeah. And I'm thinking of people like in university coming out of high school and stuff like that is that I think our world is extremely flawed because of the lack of financial education we give people. And we are told so many, I don't want, I'll call them lies when we're in school, but we're taught a lot of things, but we're not taught the basics of a bank account, of a credit card, of how a mortgage works, of how you should save 10, at least 10% of everything you earn and to set it aside, like those very basic principles. And so my advice to answer your question would be, whatever you're going to do, start as early as possible. And whatever you do, have good financial discipline. Because if you start that when you're 18 or 22, by the time you're 45 or 50, if you're not too stupid, you're pretty set for life. <laughs> I love that. Uh, I agree, Axel. Now, I've been on your show. It's a great show. Tell us about your show and how anybody else can either find you or learn more about you. Sure. You know, the, I, I started the, so it's called the Very Real Estate Effect podcast. It's about uh, real estate investing. We interview successful investors and professionals who are expert at their niche. And it's, it started because in my real estate journey, I felt like I was meeting so many people that had cool stories. And I was like, wow, like, how could we share this with more people locally? Because, you know, I, I like my city. I like Montreal. There's a lot of successful people. And at first I started with the meetup. Then I started the podcast. So the, the content actually stays when you hang up the line. And it's been such fun because I got to meet people like you and to spend a half hour, 45 minutes interviewing you that otherwise we would have never been in touch. And out of every conversation and exchange, I always walk away with three things. And I'm like, wow, all this work was worth it for those two or three tidbits of knowledge. And to this day, I'm grateful. I, and, and it's my way to give back to, to, to the community because I've gone a lot of confidence in real estate investing through listening to podcasts. And I've listened to a lot of big US ones. And it's made, it's made such a difference. So it's, it's my way to build a little bit of a community so we can be successful together. I agree. Now, what was that again? What was that podcast? It's, thank you. It's the uh, Very Real Estate Effect. Uh, you can find it on Apple, you know, on iTunes, Spotify, wherever. And then our website is uh, realestateeffect.ca, not com, .ca, because we're in Canada. Here you go. <laughs> And hit me up on Instagram. It's um, Monaxel, M-O-N-S-A-X-E-L. That's my personal account. And the um, podcast is The Very Real Estate Effect. Shoot me a little message. I'll be happy to chat. Awesome. Axel, this has been great. I really appreciate you coming on. Good seeing you again, man. We're, we're friends now. Me too. So this is great. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's been fun. Thank you so much for having me, Dustin. Awesome, Axel. Thanks.